Amen. Man, that's amazing. Amen, whoever that was. Praise God. Well, welcome Inspiration Church. My name is Josiah Jones, and man, I've had the privilege of just hanging out with your students and leaders all weekend, and it has been a blast. Like, God has been on the move, and I'll be sharing a little bit more about that uh, throughout this message this morning. And so, man, thank you for just your support and your love and the way that that has been felt the entire weekend. And so, just to give you a little bit of background uh, about me, I, I have the privilege of uh, growing up in Fort Worth, Texas. I call that the motherland. And uh, yep, I, I love Fort Worth, but you, I know you uh, love your mesquite, which I've enjoyed being here, so I might come back. But, uh, but that's where I grew up, and then God called me to uh, plant a young adult ministry up in Kansas City, and then not long ago, in July of 2019, I went on staff at a church in Dallas called Watermark Community Church, and I get to serve with a young adult ministry called The Porch, and so it has been an incredible journey so far, and I get to do that with my family. I have a w raging Cajun wife from New Orleans. I think she's going to come up on the screen here in a second. Yep, that's Kathy Gaucher Jones, so she uh, is French girl. I married her about eight years ago, and then we have two little girls, Camille Elizabeth, who is our five-year-old, and Isabella Marie is our three-year-old, and I, I thought I was just going to hang out in a sorority house for um, a while, but then about a year ago, God uh, allowed us to have a, a baby boy, and so he just turned one. That is Josiah Caleb. We call him, we call him Caleb, but uh, he's mean mugging y'all right now, so don't, don't hold it against him, but that is my fan. That's my crew, and uh, it's a joy being a dad and, and just a husband uh, to Kathy. Uh, as we get going uh, this morning, I just want to give you kind of a a snapshot of our last couple days together. If you weren't able to join us, uh, man, God has been on the move. Like we have this theme. You see these white sweatshirts all throughout this auditorium, and on the sweatshirt is the word created. And, and so we just have taken this theme called created, and we started Friday night with this idea that we have been created for worship. Like we're all going to worship something. And we see this word glory all throughout our culture. And I don't think you can understand worship without understanding this word glory. This word glory just means high renown or high praise won by notable achievement. You hear actresses and actors talk about glory. You hear uh, sports, star, sports stars talk about glory. You hear rappers talk about glory tonight at the Super Bowl. They're going to talk about glory. Like somebody is going to receive high recognition or honor based on notable achievement. And in Psalm 19, it's fitting that the God of the universe talks about glory. And this is how he describes it. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them to Psalm 19. Starting in verse 1, he says, The heavens declare or speak the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. In other words, God's saying, hey... God's revealing himself through nature, and we see his power and how finite and limited we are when we take an elevated approach and get some altitude and see who he is based on nature. I don't know where you go <clears throat> to see your finiteness. Uh, for me, I go to the beach, and I love the beach. I love looking out at the vastness of the ocean, and I like... Uh, rubbing my feet through the sand and every little particle of sand, it's like, whoa, this is nuts. Like, that screams the glory of God. Maybe for you it's the mountains. Maybe it's Mesquite, Texas. You go out in the woods somewhere. I don't know where you go to see the vastness and the glory of God. But take yourself there for a second. He goes on and says in verse 3, there is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. In other words, everyone hears and knows about God because of nature. And he says in verse 4, their voice goes out throughout the whole earth and their words to the end of the world. I, I thought about trying to illustrate this. Y'all know what these are, right? Foam fingers. Any of y'all go to A&M, Texas A&M University? Any of y'all? No? Not one person went to A&M in this place? Okay. Hey, no worries. I ain't holding against you. I didn't go there either. I went to East Texas Baptist University, okay? So y'all get on me. Um, but, but you know, fun fact, you know where these were originated? Back in the 70s. 
the Jesus movement. Back when Billy Graham came on the scene and um, it was really the, our nation's last great awakening. When our nation was awakened to the things of God through the person of Jesus Christ. And they would hold up a number one finger because Jesus is the only way. J John 14, 6, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. But it's not about the foam finger. But it is about this idea that we see in Psalm 19 that the heavens speak the glory of God. And so do you know what the Siberian tiger in Africa is doing? Glory. Do you know what the Pacific Ocean is doing? Glory. you know what Mount Everest is doing right now? Glory. It's speaking the vastness of God. Do you know what the sun's doing? It's speaking glory. You know what the sun and the stars and the moon and the rings around Saturn are doing? It's speaking glory and it's pointing back to God. But then what about you and me? Humanity. Is this the posture and the attitude of your life when you woke up this morning and you were late? Or your kids were fighting? Or, or, or is the posture of your attitude in your life like this? It's, it's about me. This life really is about me, you know. It's about my comfort. It's about my conveniences. And, and it's, it's about what I want, when I want it. It's, it's not really about him. Yeah, we, we can come into this place and we can sing some songs and we can listen to a message and we can open up God's word and, and that's our worship for the week. But worship is way bigger than that, amen? It's your life. It's what you're doing the other six days of the week. It's not just an hour and a half where you tip God and you sing a few songs and listen to a message and then leave and do nothing with it. So, so the question I have for you today, church, is what is your posture and your attitude before God? When, when people look at your life, do they see that you're pointing to something bigger than you? Bigger than the, the concerns and the worries that you have? Or, they, or they, do they look at your life and, 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 they, and they see you and they don't see anything else? So that was, that was night one where we just talked about this idea of we were created for worship. And then yesterday morning we talked about this truth that we were created for community, that we were made for relationships, that we weren't created to do life alone and coming to church is more than just potlucks and uh, singing some songs and listening to a message. Like it's this idea that we would be forged in community, that we would be forged in relationship with one another, a relationship with God vertically and relationship horizontally with one another. That we wouldn't just have these Super Bowl watch, watch parties and, and just leave it at that. But we would come together and we would understand that, that, that God has created us not just to accomplish a few tasks, but he's created us in such a way where we forge deep intimacy, not just with him, but with other people. And we learned about this idea that we'll never be fully loved until we're fully known. And I'm convinced that the church, the big C church, we come into a place like this and we put on the Christian t-shirt and nobody really knows who we really are. If you had to be honest with yourself. See, it's one thing to confess your sin before God. First John 1 John 1.9 says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's forgiveness, vertically with you and God. But a few years back, I read this verse in James 5.16 that changed everything about my relationship with believers. James 5.16 says to confess your sin one to another horizontally and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man or righteous woman availeth much. In other words, think it, like some of us, man, we come into this place, we're forgiven by God, but listen, we're walking around still broken, still running back to the same sin. And we make excuses, we justify that sin because we kind of compare our life to everybody around us, even people in the church. When you do that, you can always find someone worse than you, which gives you security in the fact that you're not that bad. And, and, and James 5.16 just says, hey, if you want to be healed, if you want to be whole, if you want to be God's man or God's woman, you wouldn't just confess to God, but you would confess to 
a faithful brother or sister that can come alongside of you and help you grow in your faith. Every Friday morning at 6 a.m., I get with four other guys who I trust, who, who are righteous men, not by their own accord, not by their own works, but because of his work, amen? And I get with them, and, and I just said, hey, this is where I've been in thought, in word, and action this week. And I begin to confess my sin one to another. And you know what they do? They stop and they pray. Let me pray for that. You know the promise in that verse that I think we overlook sometimes? It says that you'll be healed. How many of you this week have not just confessed sin to God, but you confess sin to another? And it doesn't say that you confess it to everybody. It says you, you, you find a righteous person that you trust, and that you can really do life with. Because you won't ever be fully loved until you're fully known. Because if you're not fully known, then someone's just loving some false version of you. You're just putting on a facade, and no one really knows you. See, every single week, I have an opportunity to be loved even more and more and more based on the men's response to the sin that's in my life. And I have an opportunity to be healed. I wondered this morning, are you, are you healed? Not just forgiven by God. But are you healed? Are, are you taking ground in those areas of, of sin in your life? So that was yesterday morning. We got to just talk about what it looks like to be created for community, created for relationships. And, and then last night, we got to talk about this idea that we were created for purpose, that we were created to know Jesus and to make him known. To know Jesus and, and to make him known. And this is where the faith gets exciting. But this is where the faith also is a little intimidating for some of us in this place. Because just like I asked you, hey, did you confess sin this week to someone so that you can be healed? The question I would ask you is, hey, have you shared the gospel this week with someone around you? A family member, a neighbor, a, a loved one, a you know, coffee, someone in the coffee shop or the restaurant, your waiter or waitress. To make Jesus known, to share the gospel, to move that forward wherever you have places of influence. I think the church, the Big C Church, as I've been in many of them throughout my 15 years since I came to know Jesus. I would ask the question, what is the gospel? And I would get a lot of different responses well, the gospel is God's word. The gospel is singing. The gospel is reading his word. The gospel is praying. And even this morning, I ask you, what, what is the gospel? Because where there's gospel clarity, there will be gospel confidence. And where there's gospel confidence with God's people, there will be an ability for you to be able to share that with the people around you. And so this is what I want to do. I was just praying, like, God, what would you have for me this morning? The students got to hear this, some of the leaders got to hear this. I'm, I challenge them differently and I'm challenging you this morning. But I'm asking them to write down on a piece of paper, I'll ask you to do the same. But I'm going to walk you through what I call a gospel bridge illustration to show you what it looks like to share the gospel biblically and effectively. I've shared this on my hand before. I've shared this on a piece of paper, on a whiteboard before. I've shared this on a napkin before. I believe the, the greatest tragedy in the church right now is that we don't really do anything with the message that we've been given. And, 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 and God's plan A has always been the church to move forward his message. And so this morning, I just want you to lean in. What, what I love about this message is it, is it shows you where you are in your faith See, there's two groups of people in this room this morning. There are people that know they're not really following Jesus and, 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 and know that, man, I'm kind of examining the evidence of Christ. And, and then there's people that are like, I, I'm following Jesus and I'm all in or I'm following Jesus and I'm not really doing anything with it. And I would just say that's really not following Jesus. And so let's, let's dive in. We're going to walk through this illustration and I pray that it would be a great tool for you as you begin to 
Ask the Lord what he would have for you this morning. Let's start with man. When I say man, that means you, that means me, that means humanity. And this is what we know about man. Man is created by God. Genesis 1.27 says, so God created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. So we know that man is created. We also know that man is sinful. Romans 3.23 says, for everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This glory of God is his standard. It's his perfection. We know that something is radically wrong. I haven't met one person that has ever come up to me, old or young, and said, I'm perfect. I just haven't had it. Every year, Google, I love Google. I search Google almost every day for something. <laughs> it's, it's a tool. But Google comes out with a year-end video every year, just kind of the highlights of what happened in our world. In this past year, 2021, on that year-end video, it said, do you know the, the, the most searched question on Google, do you know what it was? How to heal. Did you catch that? The most searched question in all of the world was how to heal. We know that something is radically wrong with humanity. Even people that don't, are not following Jesus, even people that don't have a faith know that something is broken. Something is just not right. It doesn't take a rocket science to look around and say, man, when sin entered the world, it sent creation into chaos. The reason why we have COVID and death and murder and rape and just divorce and lying and cheating and stealing, all those things is a result of sin. All suffering is a result of sin. Did you know that? It's not a result of a bad God. He created this place to be perfect. But he gave man a choice in that moment. He didn't want to force his love on him. He didn't want to force a relation, relationship on him. That wouldn't be a relationship. So he gave man a choice. And what had happened? Sin entered the world. God said, have it your way, Adam. And so Adam stiff-armed God like a running back stiffs arms of safety. You're going to see that tonight in the Super Bowl. Amen. And, and what happened, sin entered the world. And everything began to be fractured. We know this to be true, that man isn't just created. Man is sinful, but man is loved by God. John 3, 16. You might see a field goal kick tonight on the Super Bowl and somebody in the end zone holds up a sign, John 3, 16. Don't go on autopilot, church. When I say this verse, for God so loved the world, put your name where it says world, that he gave his one only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So on one side, you see man. On another side, then you see God. So you see God on the other side, and we know this about God. God is a creator. In Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But we also see that God is holy. 1 Peter 1.16 says, for the scriptures say you must be holy, for I am holy. This word holy means perfect. It means to be set apart. And everyone in this place has fallen short in thought, word, and action. But we also see that God is love. 1 John 4, 8 says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And so you got man on one side, you got God on the other side, and now you see a chasm because God's perfect and man's not. And what does man try to do to get to God? This is in every single one of us, even my own heart. Man tries to build bridges to get to God. For so long in my life, I was just like, man, I'm just going to be a good person. You know, I'm just going to help the homeless, maybe tip them, give them a few bucks. I'm going to, you know, just make sure I don't cuss as much and, and, you know, just, you know, make sure that, hey, that really, really bad person at school, as, as long as I'm not like them, I'm good. And so I'm just going to do some good works and be a good person and, and, and that'll get me to God. So the first bridge that man tries to build is good works. The second bridge that man tries to build is being religious. This idea that, man, if I come to church on Sunday, I might even go on Wednesday night, ooh, twice a week, I'm going to be really religious. I might even have my Bible, and I'm going to bring that when I come. And I might even read it a couple times a week, and I'm going to wear the cross necklace around my neck so that everybody sees how religious I am, how good I am. And the problem with that, church, is if you could get to heaven based on your good works, your religious deeds, what was the point of Jesus dying on the cross? 
See, every time we try to trust our work over his work, we're glory thieves. We steal glory from the one and only. And so, inevitably, those bridges fall short in a place called hell. I get it. We, we live in America, and we don't like talking about hell, but here, here's the problem. Jesus talked about it twice as much as he talked about heaven. And in 2 er, Thessalonians, excuse me, 1.9, he says this, they will be punished with eternal destruction forever, separated from the Lord and his glorious power. Like, he warned people against hell because he loves you and I. Let me ask you something. What would happen if God allowed sin into heaven? It would look a lot like this earth, this world that we live in. So therefore, he can't allow sin into heaven. He must assess a penalty for that sin. Like, he must have justice because he's a perfect God and we're imperfect people. Like, we want justice. You ever been wrong? <laughs> Just about three weeks ago, I was having lunch with uh, some good buddies who were also in ministry and we are just talking about the things of God and I walk out into the parking lot, no lie, only to see that my car has been hit and my bumper is hanging off and there is no one to report that in sight. I got hit and ran. And you know what I screamed? I'm like, I'm like, God, I'm over here having lunch talking about you with some other buddies who love you. How are you going to let this happen? Well, we live in a fallen world, and that's another message for another day. But here's the deal. You know what I screamed in that moment? Justice. <laughs> you ever scream justice? What about God? When we wrong him, when we sin against him, he's a just God. Sometimes we fail to realize that and talk about that. But you know what he did? Now this is the good news. 2,000 years ago, he came in the form of a babe, Christmas. We just got, got done celebrating it. He was raised up in wisdom and stature, and he never sinned in thought, word, and action. And he went to the cross to pay for your sin and my sin. All of our sin was poured out on him, and he soaked up every last ounce of God's wrath, the wrath that should have been poured out on you and me. Let me ask you something, church. Have your hands ever been to places that they should probably never have gone? Me too. I've stolen things. I've taken things. I've had sex before marriage. Before I came to Christ, my hands have been to places that I'm not proud of at all. The Bible says that Jesus had nails that were piercing his hands for every time your hands and my hands have gone to places they should never have gone. How about your feet? You ever taken your feet to places that they should never have gone? Me too. I'm not proud of the things that I've gone, the places I've gone. The Bible says that Jesus had nails that were piercing, a nail that was piercing his feet for every time your feet and my feet have gone to places they should never have gone. How about your eyes, man? Have you ever looked at things and thought of things that you shouldn't have looked at or thought of? I was a porn addict for a decade of my life. You know porn is killing the men in the, in the church? today do you know that and it's not just men it's women too the bible says that jesus wore a crown of thorns for every time i looked at things and you looked at things that we shouldn't have looked at or thought of see jesus doesn't just judge the actions of a man he judges the thoughts and the heart of the man and the woman because it starts within the heart within the mind so a thought, reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. So a character, reap an entire destiny. You want to get healed this morning? Start bringing the thing that you said you'd never bring to the light. The thing that you said, I'm going to take to the grave. Start bringing that to the light. There's healing for you. There's forgiveness for you. There's grace for you. I'm a recipient of that. How about your back? You ever turned your back on God? I did. One of my best friends died in a tragic plane accident 30 miles south of Casper, Wyoming. You know, the Bible says that there's some Roman centurion soldiers that took these whips, and at the end of whips were some 
glass and sharp metal objects and nails and they whip Jesus for every time you and I have turned our back on him. How about your heart? Has your heart ever hardened itself to God? Me too. When I was making the transition from fifth to sixth, my mom and dad came into our living room and a bomb was dropped in our living room. Not literally, metaphorically. They said they were getting a divorce. The Bible says that another soldier pierced Jesus right underneath the heart. For every time your heart and my heart hardened itself to God. Here is the incredible picture that I'm painting this morning. Jesus can free your hands, your feet, your eyes, your thoughts, your back, and your heart. Why? Because justice was paid at the cross, y'all. Justice was paid at the cross. We, we scream justice when we've been wrong. What about when God's been wrong? He looks to his son and says, I, I got grace for my people. I got grace for humanity. He screams justice because his son paid it. And the justice that he paid is not the justice that you have to pay. You're freed from it. That is one of the greatest messages I've ever heard in my life. And I heard it as I was playing baseball, chasing everything underneath the sun, thinking I had life at its coattails. And I just shared with you the man that I was. But someone shared that message with me, and it struck me to the heart. And I'm like, that's what I need because the things I'm pursuing aren't leading to life. They're leading to more and more death. Proverbs 14, 12 says there's a way that seems right to man or there's a way that seems right to woman. And that way ends in death. You want to give people hope? Share the only message that can give them hope. The only message that's going to last for all of eternity. The, the beautiful thing about this message is Jesus just didn't die. Scripture says and his, history records that he rose again to defeat sin and death. That is incredible. You know, that makes Christianity different than all other religions because all other religions claim that their God is dead. But Jesus burst forth from the grave after the third day, and he, when he did that, he defeated sin and death. And now the ball is in your court. Man stands at a distance from God, but God created the bridge, and he says, what are you going to do with it? And the only appropriate response, the only appropriate response is what Romans 10, 9, and 10 says. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he's going to be the leader of your life, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, it says heart twice. That's important. Circle that. It, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You know what that's saying? That confession plus belief equals salvation. This idea of confessing, this isn't just like a lip service to God. God, would you forgive me? No, confessing is that you do a 180 from the sin that you are pursuing and you go in the opposite direction and you get with some men or you get with some ladies and you say, hey, this gossip, it's become a problem. This being short with my wife, I gotta confess that almost every single week. Being, have the wrong tone with my kids. Listen, I, I need you to take ground in this or maybe it's something uh, else, some of the other sin that I've shared this morning. And you confess that, you say, let's go. I, 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 it doesn't disqualify me. My, my sin actually qualifies me to be forgiven. You know, all you need is need to be forgiven. Do you have need this morning? I wonder, do, do you have need this morning? Or have you listened to this message week in and week out, and it just kind of goes in autopilot, and you're just like, yeah, I've heard that before. And it doesn't really move you anymore. M maybe it doesn't move you anymore because you don't really believe it. Because here's what I know about men and women. Men and, men and women always say what they think, but they do what they believe. See, I was an intellectual believer for 22 years of my life. I, I wonder this morning, are you moved? And if you're not, hey, j the best thing you could do is just be honest with God. God, I'm, I'm just not moved by this message. Would you help me? Would you stir this up within me to be moved? God stirred this up with some students this weekend. Can I share? Can I share some of the things that they 
boldly stepped out in faith and, and said, hey, I'm walking away from this. I'm burying this. I'm dying to this. Fear of anxiety. Lies from the devil. Depression. Family brokenness. Broken relationships, comparison, video games at an unhealthy level, gossip, bitterness, others' opinions. I bury every time I find acceptance outside of God. I bury every time I look at someone else and hate them out of jealousy. I bury every time I look at lust and give myself to the desires of this world. I bury every time I disown myself because I know I was not good enough. I bury every time I took the focus off of God. Recognition, approval, pornography, sex. Dissatisfaction, comparison. Family, brokenness, addiction, doubt, bad language, loneliness, approval. Too many things taking my time away from Jesus. Maybe that, maybe that resonates with you this morning. Let me, let me say something. If you're too busy to be a Christian, you're too busy. If you keep making excuses after excuses why you're not getting in God's word, why you're not reading, why you're not spending time in prayer, why you're not serving, why you're not sharing the gospel with others, then you're too busy, man. If you're too busy to be a Christian, you're too busy. And listen, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not advocating that you do all these things so that you can be saved. No, I'm advocating you do these things because you are saved. We don't work for our salvation. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 that we've been saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift from God so that no man may boast. But once we are saved, we do work from our salvation. I don't get in God's word and pray and share the gospel because I have to. I do it because I want to. And there's times that are dry. I would be a, I'd be a liar and a hypocrite to stand up here and say, that there's not, there's not dry times. That's why I need God's men. That's why I need others in my life to remind me and say, let's go, church. Let's go, Josiah. Bitterness, anger against people who I have hurt, comparing my life to others, telling myself that I'm better than that person, sexual addiction. One thing I could bury and give up is caring about what everyone else thinks about me, smoking weed, temptations, being ashamed of the gospel, body image, bitterness. Wow. If that's not revival, church, I don't know what is. I know that in a room of this size, there's some stuff that needs to be confessed. And we have a chance this morning to do business with God. You can continue to look at this message and be apathetic, or you can ask God to forgive you for your apathy. You can say, God, I've heard that before. You could say, God, you know what? I'm gonna write this down, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get with five people this week that are believers, and we're gonna grab coffee. I'm gonna have them over at the house, and we're just gonna practice how to share the gospel because it's uncomfortable for me and it's intimidated for me. Josiah, what if they ask me about homosexuali homosexuality? I don't know. What if they ask you about homosexuality? You know, 23 times in the New Testament, Jesus was asked questions. You know how he answered them? With a question. You know, I don't have all the questions or all the answers to people's questions. I don't know. What do you think about homosexuality? What do you think God thinks about homosexuality? Well, what, 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 what about, you know... Abortion. I don't know. What do you think about abortion? What do you think God thinks about abortion? I mean, just, I mean, you don't have to have all the answers. And everything is uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable. Some of you played sports in here. Not everything was comfortable all the time, but what did you do? You got your reps. You did with th the same thing over and over and over until it became comfortable, and until it be just was a knee-jerk reaction. What if you got with some men? What if you got with some women this week and you started practicing how to share your faith? You want to start revival in this church? You, you, you want to see this church turned inside out for the glory of God? Start with you sharing your faith. Better yet, start with you spending time with Jesus and just saying, God, I'm your servant and I'm wanting to listen to you. 
So, so it's, it's, it's a simple takeaway. God, would you move in a way where I reconnect with you this week? And God, would you move in a way where I reconnect with other people this week? So that what you have taught me can be taught to other people. And God, I'm not going to worry about people's opinions or worrying about having to find all the answers. Or God, I'm not going to worry about, um, you know, if people come to know you. Because listen, the scoreboard isn't saving. The scoreboard is you sharing. Like, like we would just celebrate. Like what if we gathered back in this place or in our small groups and we just celebrated. Hey, were you able to share the gospel this week? Yes. Did they come to Christ? No, but you shared. Praise God. Let's, let's celebrate. There's a party in heaven. Let's go. Like God is looking down upon you and saying, well done. What would it look like, church, every day, if you got up before your feet hit the ground, your knees hit the ground, and you know that thing, I know my thing, it's pride, it's anger, and it's lust. Every day before my feet hit the ground, I got to hit my knees and say, God, I know my thing is pride. I know I want to live a life apart from you. I know I want to go throughout my day and listen, I, I, I want to depend more on Josiah than on you. Would you forgive me for that pride? Why well, don't invite you in spaces of work and other relationships and extracurricular activities? Would you forgive me for being prideful? God, I know anger is quick to spring up in my heart. I have mama wounds, God. You know my mama wounds. My mama walked out on me. That's my story. And when people wrong me, God, I'm quick to snap at them. I'm, I'm quick to 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 want to yell and have a wrong tone with my wife and even my kids. So God, you you know that that anger is is my thing. Would you help me to forgive my mama today? Would you help me to have a new relationship with the sin that's in my life so that I can experience grace and forgiveness from you? And as I experience grace and forgiveness from you, I can forgive other people. Because you know what I know, church? Forgiven people forgive people. And if you have a forgiveness problem, then you should ask yourself, have you really experienced the forgiveness of God? Because if you've been given that, you can give it away. And then thirdly, for me, every day before I hit, my feet hit the ground, my knees hit the ground, I say, God, you know the lust that lures in my heart. I want to have eyes only for my wife. She's the only source of my affection. Lord, would you help me to bounce my eyes quickly at all the things that culture is trying to throw at me? God, would you help me to um, depend on your strength and not my strength? And then the final prayer, God, through my brokenness, but through your forgiveness, it's great. Would you help me, God? to share this with people. Would you just ask me to pray for boldness? God, would you, just, would you just challenge me to pray for that? Would you challenge me to meet people where they are? Would you help me to walk slowly through the crowd, God? Would you help me to be aware at the needs around me so that I can share the greatest need, the need that they're gonna die apart from you if they don't know you and if they haven't put their faith and trust in you? And maybe this week you would share the gospel bridge illustration. God would begin to stir up in your heart something that's been vacant for very, very long. So God, would you have your way in this place? Would you use Inspiration Church to be an inspiration to the people in Mesquite, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area? And would you use the, the men and women who want to say yes to you first and foremost and then say yes to people around them to go out and share the only hope it's going to matter for all of eternity. The hope of the gospel. May your name be great in this place. May you give us courage. May you help us to have the humility to walk with you. It's in Christ's name we pray.